I would like to now turn to my diocesan address. You will see the collect of the day that we will pray together at the beginning of this address on your screen. Please pray with me. Almighty God, in Christ you have made all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. When I think of how 2021 has been for us, it has been this mixture of, on the one hand, experiencing personally what our prayer just described as the poverty of our nature, and also a renewal that opens the doors for God's heavenly glory. So on the one hand, this year has in fact been incredibly difficult. Dante Stewart, in an article entitled Staying Alive in the Meantime, puts it this way, quote, To be completely honest, I thought this year would begin not with questions, more questions, but with resolutions. And to be completely honest, I don't think another year is enough to deal with the death and disease and disappointments of these last few years. New years and new dreams are interesting. They feel something like an old piano. You know it doesn't always work, but you play it sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes making music, sometimes making chaos, sometimes fumbling your way into something that ends up beautiful. But you also know that some things just don't work like they used to. That's life. We are learning how to live with broken things. But he also writes, trouble doesn't always last, the preacher says. Is that true? I will tell you, it is that desire that keeps me grounded and growing. That's enough of a re resolution. Trouble doesn't always last. It's not eternal. That's the gospel for me and for us. In other words, the genuine tragedies we have experienced, loss of members, financial drought, health struggles, friends dying, the kind of tribal divisions we are experiencing do not tell the whole story. Recently, I posted online this, quote, in a malaise of many cross currents, I have had the sense of God reaching into the malaise and touching me with his tenderness. It's so undeserving. God's mercies never come to an end. The promise of unending mercies, unending fellowship with God, is contained in each reminder of his nearness. Denise Leverton writes this, Days pass when I forget this mystery. Problems insoluble, problems offering their own ignored solutions, jostling for my attention. They crowd in the antechambers with a host of diversions. My courtiers wearing their colors, capes, hats, and bells. But then, once more, quiet mystery becomes present to me. The throngs recede. The mystery that there is still anything at all, let alone cosmos, joy, memory, everything rather than void, and that, O oh Lord, creator, hallowed one, you still, hour by hour, sustain it. Lamentation puts it this way, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. One of the expressions of faithfulness in my life is my wife, Laura Lee. She rarely travels with me now that she is taking care of her 94-year-old father who lives with us, but she prays for all of you, asks about each visit and the people she remembers, and is still involved in this ministry, especially in the support I receive from her every single day. And every single day, I am profoundly grateful, more than I can say, for her love and support. Besides being the proud grandparents of six grandchildren, which we enjoyed over the Christmas holidays, we also, as you know, have a new lab puppy, Lucy, who at the insistence of the staff made a star appearance in our diocesan Christmas card this year. 
Thankfully, she's not keeping me up as much tonight as she used to. Our staff, especially my executive assistant, Sarah Caprani, serving today as secretary to the convention, continues to go above and beyond all that is asked of her. Marilyn Lang, assistant, administrative assistant to Canon Scott, and of course, Canon Scott Holcomb, Canon to the Ordinary. Eric Perez, our receptionist and administrative assistant. Eric Guzman, our director of communications. Beverly Jennings, assistant to our administrator, Earl Pickett. Earl Pickett, our di diocesan administrator and CFO. Sue Grosso, Administrative Assistant, Archdeacon Christy Alday, Ellen Seeley, Administrative Assistant to Canon Justin, and Canon Justin Holcomb, Canon for Vocations, Kirsten Knox, Consultant for Youth Ministry, and also serving with us our Chancellors, Council Wooten and Bill Grimm, and our Disaster Relief Coordinator, the Reverend John Modis. Each one continues to serve in whatever capacity is needed, regardless of job description, in a way that just continues to elicit my sincerest appreciation and thanks. I can say without hesitation, we're a team. We enjoy each other's company, we laugh a lot, and we work incredibly hard, hopefully for both the glory of God and for the good of this diocese. I will say that over this past year, nothing has been more controversial than the COVID guidelines that have been published since the beginning of the pandemic. Ken and Scott Holcomb has provided excellent information based on his research, especially in our efforts to respond to the statistics like positivity rates, hospitalizations, deaths. Our goal from the beginning was to offer guidelines that would allow our churches to be as medically safe as possible during this unprecedented time, paying particular attention to those who are vulnerable, especially our elderly. The reaction to these guidelines has been the entire range of emotions, sheer gratitude, an unhappy but acknowledged sense that we are all in this together, gratitude for the balance and wisdom expressed in the guidelines, to seeing the guidelines as an assault on our personal freedom of worship, being accused, I was really, of killing people because we recommended the vaccines. It pains me that some of our churches have seen these guidelines and rejected them because they inhibit the healthy rather than our efforts to protect the most vulnerable. By contrast, Jesus is always concerned about the least of these. In very detrimental ways, this pandemic has played upon our already troubled sense of us versus them that plagues our common life. Everyone's individual experience of the pandemic has deeply covered each one's view of the whole. We don't believe anyone who doesn't agree with our personal experience of the pandemic or the advice we believe to be true, which leaves us with the burden of thinking individually in a global pandemic. This sometimes leads to medical decisions based merely on anecdotal stories, the person whose ear you want to listen to. For example, one woman posted on Facebook about how she had contracted COVID, took ivermectin, and began to feel remarkably better, thus concluding online that the advice against ivermectin was in fact a plot. At the same time, another friend posted on Facebook that her stepfather had contracted COVID, took ivermectin at the device of his friends, but the drug had no effect on his COVID condition, and he died in the hospital. Regardless of how you and your congregation are experiencing the pandemic, one thing is true. Quoting Canon Dan Smith of Holy Cross Sanford, quote, there is no going back to what was we have to see our churches as they are now. In the midst of these trying and extraordinary times, there are congregations that see the church as it is now, and they have changed, adopted, and in the midst of this upheaval, in fact, are thriving. They have started innovative new ministries. New minister members have found them. They are financially stable. And most importantly, they are reaching new people with the gospel. There are numerous congregations that tell that story. I can't cover all of them because they are many, but I do want to highlight just a few. Under the leadership of the Reverend Cynthia Brust, Christ Church Vieira, 
formerly Hope Church, has experienced a renaissance with a small but committed congregation, a new sign, renovated grounds, and a big welcome. Holy Faith Dunellen, under the leadership of Paul Hamilton, tells the same story. Growth in church attendance, plans for building expansion, new programs, and even a Spanish language service. Under the leadership of Canon de Luis de la Cruz, Spanish language services have also been started at St. John's Melbourne, and there is a new church startup in Poinciana. In response to a vaccine distribution that underserves numerous low-income communities, St. John the Baptist in Washington Shores, under the leadership of the Reverend Charles Myers and Jesus de Nazaret in Azalea Park, under the Reverend Jose Rodriguez, teamed up to create vaccine distribution centers on both campuses, which are in underserved communities. A grant from the Lilly Foundation continues to underwrite a flourishing residency program, a program that is raising up new leaders and also providing seed money for innovations in outreach. For example, the 11 churches in the Northeast Deanery matched an initial grant of $5,000 to give $10,000 to local Christian ministries. St. David's Cocoa Beach under the Reverend Porter Taylor has started the St. David's Institute, a theological training program for lay people. Holy Presence, under the leadership of Don McDonald, has built a new outdoor prayer walk. Gateway of Hope, which began as a small feeding program on the grounds of the former St. Patrick's Episcopal Church in Ocala, today, under the leadership of the Reverend James Giles, reaches across Marion County. They collaborate with many churches and businesses, and over the past year, they report that they have invested over a half million dollars in contributions to the community and are handling 15 to 20,000 pounds of food per week. Most importantly, offerings of food are accompanied by offers of prayer and emotional support. They are decidedly and publicly Christian. They report that there have been many answers to prayer, including physical and emotional healings happening through this ministry. Volunteers come from across the community and many churches, but particularly St. George's Church in the village. All Saints Lakeland, under the leadership of the Reverend Reed Henserling and Kathy Hewlin, responded to what they described as, quote, historically low in-person attendance, unquote, with a variety of online Zoom and live stream opportunities, which have resulted in new members and giving is up. In the face of this response, they have now made the decision that 2022 will be their year for intentionally building a stronger communications ministry. And of course, the continuing establishment and growth of All Souls Horizons West, the church which should not have been there, to quote Matt Ainsley, under the leadership of Father Ainsley, a church plant that is now an official mission of the diocese. In 2021, there were 12 ordinations, eight people to the permanent diaconate, four persons to the priesthood. In 2021, we had 45 people in our ordination process, 16 women, 29 men, nine people of color. Our process is the envy of many within the Episcopal Church and aspiring ordinance from other parts of the country seek to be in our process. None of this could have happened without the superb leadership of Kenneth Justin Holcomb and the Commission on Ministry under the chairmanship of Orman Kimbrough, who continues to do an outstanding job. Our ordination process was recently showcased at a conference for the Diocese of the Southeastern part of the United States known as Province Four. Our team included Canon Justin Holcomb, Mr. Orman Kimbrough, and the Reverends Jose Rodriguez and Richard Gonzalez. People were stunned when I reported that we averaged 45 people annually in our process. One person said, quote, gosh, in our diocese, we're lucky to have four, unquote. I made 43 Episcopal visits in our congregations. I confirmed 180 people, receiving 55 people into the Episcopal Church. 21 reaffirmed their baptismal vows. I baptized three people. I presided at six celebrations of new ministry. Father John Pallard is priest in charge of Holy Family Orlando. Mother Robin Reed at St. Francis Lake Placid. Father Matthew Perol at St. Thomas Eustace. Father Wes Shields at St. Augustine of Canterbury, Vero Beach. 
Father Samuel Insiguma, Holy Trinity, Fruitland Park, and Father Matthew Dahlman, St. Paul's, New Smyrna Beach. Camp Wingman continues to thrive under the fine leadership of Mr. Joshua Joseph with renovating facilities, including the new Yates Hall, and, and they are continuing to offer a limited but successful safe, safety-conscious camping experiences, and they hope to have a full camping schedule back this fall. Not all has gone well, however. Several churches have wrestled with cases of serious financial mismanagement, some of which having to do with the misuse of clergy discretionary funds. In response, Ken and Holcomb developed and I approved a diocesan-wide policy on the use of clergy discretionary funds. It conforms completely to the Episcopal Church's policies as expressed in their published Manual for Business. That policy was distributed at our annual clergy conference last October and can be found on our diocesan website. That policy will also be distributed at our upcoming vestry training day on the 5th of March. I would urge your vestries to attend. The Canterbury Retreat and Conference Center, which is where we are broadcasting this convention, has actually also suffered severely under this pandemic. The good news was, at first, the slowdown in bookings created significant space for beautiful renovations. Just watch the video that has been developed. There's a moment. Sometimes it's early, just as the sun breaks over Lake Jem. Sometimes it's a quiet pause in the prayer garden or somewhere along the bishop's walk. Or maybe as friends part ways after a late night conversation around the fire. And in this moment, we forget our worries and fears and doubts. We forget the stresses and demands of the outside world and remember God, the God who changes hearts, hearts who return home from these moments refreshed and ready to change their communities. Moments like this are why we exist. Moments like this are what you help create when you give and donate. Because no matter where someone is from or how much they have, everyone deserves to experience this moment. As the trend of program cancellations and only smaller groups attending has continued, Canterbury finds itself in the midst of a serious financial shortfall. Mr. Chalmers Morse continues to do an outstanding job as director, and I must admit that Canterbury would have closed its doors by now were it not for his excellent leadership. While bookings are up for the second half of 2022 and beyond, the center remains in a cash crunch and is in need of additional bookings. Right now, the board on which I serve has undertaken a short-term fundraising effort to bring in at least $150,000 in new money to cover the Im imminent shortfall. A challenge grant in response has already been offered of $50,000, which is phenomenal. And some of you are watching today have the capacity and even the desire to contribute to their ongoing ministry here in Central Florida, I would urge you to financially contribute to Canterbury. Thanks to the excellent work of Mr. Eric Guzman, our communications director, the Central Florida Episcopalian has been redesigned. Our website continues to be revamped and updated. He is the one who employed Comco, the organization doing the camera work, to broadcast this convention as they did last year. They're a terrific organization, great, great to work with, and I'm very grateful for their expertise. It is because of them that this is going as smoothly as it is. I continue to serve as a member of the board of the Bishop Grayan Retirement Foundation. That foundation, as you saw in the video earlier, serving older Episcopalians who live within the three dioceses of South Florida. They offer financial assistance based on need for those who need assistance with housing and care. If you know people in your congregations who have that need, do not hesitate 
to encourage them to apply. This past year, I also commissioned retired Bishop Dorsey Henderson, now living in Mount Dora, Mr. Todd Pittenger, attorney and parishioner at St. Michael's Orlando, and Canon Ernie Bennett, presently serving as interim at St. Peter the Fisherman, New Smyrna Beach, to develop a diocesan conflict resolution policy for vocational deacons. That work has filled a serious omission in our customary, and thanks to their fine work, I am happy to report it is nearing completion. This past year, there was a generous, genuine, generous sorry, outpouring of financial assistance. $16,000 was raised for earthquake relief for Haiti. I'm grateful to Père Sonar Alexander of Basaya Winter Garden, who presides at their French-speaking Haitian service for working with the diocese on finding ways to get the money to people in Haiti where it is needed most. 10,000 in relief was raised for tor tornado damage in Kentucky, and a check is on its way to the Diocese of Kentucky now. An additional 2,500 came in providing additional assistance besides the 275,000 already received to the Diocese of the Bahamas in their hurricane recovery. The Anglican Diocese of Belize receives with gratitude our financial assistance and prayerful support expressed through the ministry of Deacon Johnny Clark and his wife Jackie Bailey Clark, who continue to, for the sake of the gospel, just give with great joy and tireless service. As you can see, the Diocese of Central Florida continues to be a place of significant financial generosity, and I'm deeply grateful to all of you who are contributing. At the invitation of the Episcopal Church, I was invited to represent our southeastern province, Province 4, at the Diocesan Convention of the Diocese of Puerto Rico. The Reverend Jose Rodriguez accompanied me as my translator. I was asked because Central Florida contains the largest population of Puerto Ricans in the United States outside the island of Puerto Rico itself. We are talking about deep, developing deeper friendships and relationships. One of the highlights of the year was the Radical Vocations Conference, or RADVO, offered at the Church of the Incarnation Dallas and organized by the communion partner bishops with special leadership provided by the Diocese of Dallas in Central Florida. The focus of the conference was a call to priesthood and approximately 150 people participated. Speakers included greetings from the Archbishop of Canterbury, who rejoices in this event, as well as top scholars and capable practitioners. It is the largest gathering of its kind in the Episcopal Church. I preached at a service of Evensong and Canon Justin Holcomb led a workshop at the event. We had a great team of people who staffed a booth and a number of people ex expressed interest in our ordination process and in our residency program. I was invited by Nashota House to teach a, a one-week credit intensive class on preaching. I also preached at their weekly Eucharist. It was a joyous time to be there. And I personally met with each of our clergy and seminarians who are, resident, who are residences at Nashota House. I was invited to in visit Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan. Western is doing a superb job in training Spanish, -speaking, Spanish speakers for ordained ministry, something, of course, that is of significant interest to us. I came at the invoca invitation of Dr. Wynn Collier, a fact faculty member and author of the authorized biography of Eugene Peterson, a book I would highly recommend. Dr. Wynn Collier is now in our ordination process. I preached at St. George's Church in Nashville. I preached at the Order of St. Luke National Leadership Conference, a hybrid event in person and online. I helped lead the National Fall Assembly of the Daughters of the King, for whom I continue to serve as their national chaplain. I preached at our annual clergy conference. I continue to serve on the Swanee Board of Trustees, and I am a member of their Church Support and Relations Committee. I continue to be grateful for the ministry of Patrick Augustine, Anglican Bishop of the Diocese of Bor in South Sudan. Bishop Patrick has ministered in 10 churches in 2021, and they have donated over $63,000 for the work of that Sudanese diocese, an astonishing number. 
While in Central Florida, Bishop Augustine has made Trinity House on the campus of St. John's Kissimmee his home while he is here. And Bishop Augustine reports that, quote, the kingdom of God, unquote, can be found at Trinity House, and I would agree. That ministry center is a lighthouse that serves hundreds of people each year. And Canon Luis de la Cruz and the people of St. John's Kissimmee should be justly proud and grateful for how God is using them. Bishop Augustine will be back with us in the spring. We continue to maintain strong relationships with Stephen and Mary Doss in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and were it not for, their, for COVID, they would be here. The same is true for Bishop Lloyd Allen of Honduras. The Diocese of Central Florida and Honduras continue to have the oldest um, companionship in the Episcopal Church, and I continue to be grateful for his friendship and look forward to working with him for he is a strong voice in the House of Bishops and at our general convention. That's 2021. So what about 2022? Many of you will remember that on March 24th, 2012, at the First Baptist Church in Orlando, I was ordained and consecrated the fourth bishop of the Diocese of Central Florida. Now, over 10 years later, it has come time for me to call for the election of my successor. As per the canons, that election will be directed and guided by our standing committee. The Reverend Christopher Rodriguez, outgoing president of the standing committee, is serving now as chair of the search committee. He will be making a presentation on that election process and the 2022-2023 calendar for that election. This process began in March of 2021 when I contacted Bishop Todd Owsley, Bishop of the Episcopal Church, Office of Pastoral Development. Bishop Owsley has responsibility to oversee each diocesan election. Bishop Owsley has been in conversation with the Standing Committee. The Standing Committee has hired a consultant to assist them. The process has begun. Later today, Father Rodriguez will lay out a timeline and explain what it takes to elect a new bishop for this diocese. So, as per the canons, quote, in accordance with Article 2, Section 9 of the Constitution of the Episcopal Church, which states, upon attaining the age of 72 years, a bishop shall resign from all jurisdiction of the Episcopal Church, unquote, I hereby give notice that I resign as Bishop Diocesan of the Diocese of Central Florida, effective July 6th, 2023. And I call for the election of my successor at a special convention of the Diocese of Central Florida on January 14th, 2023. But this episcopacy is not over yet. And while I remain officially in office, there are things that we can do together. This summer, the Daughters of the King Triennial will take place in Baltimore. This is, this is an international gathering of daughters from around the world. I will be there serving as their chaplain. The General Convention of the Episcopal Church will take place a few days later, July 7th through 14th, also in Baltimore. I will be serving on the Legislative Review Committee as well as Program, Budget, and Finance a commission where Canon Ernie Bennett and Bishop Russell Jacobus have served previously. My wife and I will be attending the international gathering of the Lambeth Conference of Bishops and Spouses, which will meet at Canterbury, England, January 27th through August 8th. Each bishop, if that bishop is doing the work, faces resignation with a sense of unfinished business. There is always more to do. And closer to home, I believe there are three initiatives worthy of our under undertaking. None of these will be a surprise to those who have followed my episcopacy closely. Number one, developing a better system for the pastoral care of our retired clergy. There are many retired clergy who move here and affiliate with the local congregation and receive fine ministry from their clergy. But there are others who move directly to retirement or nursing communities, and they do not necessarily make that pastoral connection. In the past, I've recruited different retired clergy to undertake that responsibility, but it has proven too cumbersome for all of them, and none of them tried to recruit any sort of team to assist them. My hope 
is to form such a team who will continue to connect both with each other and with the retired clergy in our diocese to build a network of support. If anyone is interested in being a part of that team, please get in touch with me directly. The second area where I want to continue to do some work has to do with race relations. While anti-racism training is a requirement for anyone serving in this diocese, the political cultural climate it's doing, is doing its best to divide us. And the latest discussions about what may or may not be taught in Florida's public school classrooms have only made matters more complicated, to say the least. Therefore, I've turned to our local chapter of the Union of Black Episcopalians to assist me. I have asked that chapter, under the fine leadership of Dr. John Robertson and Mother Michelle Roach, now known as the Nelson Pinder Memorial Chapter, to organize a group of people who will meet with each other and then talk with me about the state of race relations from their perspective in the Diocese of Central Florida. I want to learn from them and ask them to help me think through what we might be able to do together. Lastly, and most importantly, I would like each of us to think and pray about how our congregations can do a better job of telling others about Jesus. And I want to give credit to the Reverend Dr. Kara Slade, a Princeton Seminary and Episcopal priest, who helped me with this particular section. You may think, of course, that's what we do. But many of our congregations actually live with a far smaller goal, which is to offer pastoral care to the people who show up at their services. I think the pandemic is showing us how inadequate that goal is if our churches are going to thrive, even pastorally, as well as grow numerically in 2022 and beyond. Let's watch a video given to us by Deacon Kim Spears about what she and others are doing at St. Edward's Mount Dora. Hi, I am Deacon Kim Spear, and I am a deacon with St. Edward's Episcopal Church in Mount Dora, Florida, and I'm so glad to have this opportunity today to share the ministry that God has brought our parish to. I would like to start by telling you about a spaghetti event that we did. For seven weeks, we involved the local food bank as well as the city of Mount Dora to get our advertising out and we fed the community 200 people, spaghetti meals uh, through a drive-through basis because this was heavy during the time of the pandemic. So cars rolled through, we delivered the meals directly to their car window, took their prayer requests and were able to put those requests on a spiritual care table where we had prayer warriors available to pray for them and it was absolutely incredible. Out of that, we took the leftover meals to an underserved part of our community about five blocks away and were able to deliver meals to folks sitting outside on a beautiful evening and that led to the opportunity to pray for these folks. The meal was simply the tool to bring the gospel and the hope of Jesus to them and it was awesome. That led us to a relationship with a local pastor in that community where we held a Thanksgiving food event and a spaghetti and barbecue event on July 4th. And one thing after another, it's just been awesome to see God expand the territory in a community so desperately in need. Birth from that as well was our drive-through prayer, which we've done for five months and we do it the last Saturday of every month. And we have folks standing on the street corners with signs saying drive through prayer, come let us pray for you. And we've had folks come in, we have no clue who they are. They just have a stirring in their heart from the spirit. And we are blessed and privileged to be able to pray for them in those moments in their cars. I take that same ministry into the hospital as a hospital chaplain uh, at UF Health in Leesburg and have the opportunity to just be a non-anxious presence to the folks who are vulnerable and sick in a hospital bed. 
and be there for them, to listen to them, pray for them, and share the love of Christ. We're so excited to be able to be a part of working for the kingdom and making the gospel known. And we just look forward to God continuing to expand our territory and just pray the same blessings for you and your parish and your communities in which you serve. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Kim Spear. What did you notice? Did you see that much of what they were doing was beyond the four walls of the church? While there are fine programs such as Alpha being offered in several congregations, these are pictures from what Grace Church Ocala is doing, that take place within our local church, congregations that are actually reaching the unreached more often than not create ways to connect with people who never darken the doors of our churches and never will unless we go to them. This kind of outreach, though, does not always require a new program. What is essential is a renewed heart. To paraphrase Swiss theologian Karl Barth, quote, to be a Christian is not a natural process, but an incomparably concrete fact of grace. This is so precisely from the viewpoint of radical astonishment. Christ is that infinitely wondrous event that compels a person to be necessarily, profoundly, holy, and irrevocably astonished. This is that astonishment that causes the heart to cry, how could I be the recipient of such unmerited love? Surely God's mercies endure forever. It is out of that astonishment, that joy of being found by Christ, that freedom comes from knowing that our sins are forgiven and the hunger from, to tell others about Jesus begins to germinate. We want to share with others how God came to our rescue and drew us to himself with cords of love. It comes out of that stark reminder that God in his, in his mercy, mercy has thankfully wrecked our lives from trusting in anything else but his saving power. We know that God cared for us enough to bring us to the end of our own dishonesty about our true spiritual condition. And we have faced the fact that without Christ, we would be utterly lost. What does the hymn say? All my hope on God is founded. He will still my trust renew. We now live in a spiritual climate where numbers of those who used to count themselves as churchgoers are now a part of the non-churchgoing public. And Jesus did describe a time when the love of the great body will grow cold. We are in one of those times. Does that number include people you know? Might that number even include you? Has the dullness of your blinded sight robbed you of the adoration due our Savior? Has spiritual fervor in you been replaced by routine, courtesy, but the sad willingness just to get by? Are you content to live on the thin gruel of just being nice? To tell others about Jesus is to move in the opposite spirit of this spiritual coldness, in the deep assurance that we are loved, forgiven by God, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to serve others in his name. To tell others about Jesus is a commitment that calls us to serve rather than be served, to pray for those we know, to speak up instead of being quiet when the time arises, to see the spiritual life and health of those we know to be of profound personal importance. Clergy, how can you lead your congregations in that kind of passion? How might you rediscover that kind of passion in your own life? What spirit of renewal, repentance, and recommitment is necessary for you and I to again know the fire of God within us that burns so brightly with his love? Come, Diocese of Central Florida. Joy awaits you. Purpose awaits you. New doors for ministry are opening in our hearts. God is doing this. There is a spiritual hunger present in our communities that only Jesus can satisfy. 
You have the privilege of being a part of that harvest if you are willing. I would urge you to think and pray about how your congregation can be a part of what God is doing right now, which is bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ. The answer isn't better marketing or better programs. The answer lies in congregations that know how to welcome guests as fellow sinners in need of a savior. Churches where ordinary people can be honest about their lives and receive mercy, companionship, forgiveness, and wisdom. Churches where people can be real with God and know that in response, God, in his great love, will be real with them. Thank you for the continuing privilege of serving you as your bishop. I continue to do all that I can to be faithful to the commission given to me both by God and by you to express the faith of Jesus Christ in all that I do. May God help us to continue to find ways to do this together. We won't do it together perfectly. We will need to forgive one another as well as rejoice, weep occasionally as well as laugh, but I do believe that God is in our midst. May God help us to continue to find ways to serve together. For all of this, our sisters and brothers, our lives in Christ, and the continuing God's, of God's call to mission, I say thank you to God. Thanks be to God.